Hey everyone, and welcome to our DAT IQ Weekly Market Update. Uh, it's a snow day. You might notice we're down a man. Um, turns out the East Coast power grids are a little more robust than those out in Oregon, Dean. Yeah, yeah, we're used to it, uh, dare I say. So um, before we get anything, I hope everyone out there is staying safe, making smart decisions about uh, heading out to the roads. As you can tell, I'm in my basement. I did not venture out. Uh, Dean, it was above freezing where you are, right? So it was mainly rain. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's 45 degrees here and raining, so I've got a flooding problem in the backyard from two feet of snow that wants to run down the hill towards our house, so I uh, need to get the pump out shortly, which is the exact opposite of what most people are going through. It was literally pouring ice last night here, snow, ice. Um, right. The central interchange where right in northeast Ohio is completely closed down. I mean, everything mm -hmm. is just jammed up, so if you're in, you know, you're a trucker and you're trying to get, get through, I would just encourage you to be safe. Um, and, and do your best to stay stay safe and warm out there. So uh, for those unfamiliar with the show, we're here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern um, talking about freight trend, trends. Um, I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics at DAT, joined uh, today just by Dean, who's our Principal Industry Analyst. Normally Ned, our Principal Data Scientist, joins us. We talk about current trends in the freight market, take a look at the future, and answer your questions. Um, one thing our producer wanted me to mention is we usually get a whole bunch of our questions at the end, which means we sometimes can't get to all of them. So if you do have a question, uh, feel free to drop it in the chat or comment section at any time. We have folks standing by to get those over to us, and hopefully it will allow us to get to more questions. And before I dive in today, I wanted to give a shout out. Our marketing team put together a really awesome um, report, 2021 Freight Focus. Um, they basically solicited some expert feedback from Dean, um, Inam Ayub, Chris Kaplis, and myself about what we think is going to happen next year, some top freight markets, really a great thing. It's linked down below. Highly recommend checking it out. It's pretty light reading, uh, but impactful. So with that, I'm going to go over to key points for the week. So again, spot rates rise as temperatures dip. Um, as you can expect, reefer load post volume surge, a lot of protect from freeze is, is bundled in there. Um, I have no idea how to pronounce that first one. We'll say Yuri um, in Viola set uh, uh, records. We're going to talk more about the polar vortex at the end. It's actually our Ask IQ question, spoiler alert. Um, but Dallas, Houston, uh, we have family in Florida, all seeing freezing temperatures, um, which brings us to our last point, that polar vortex is dipping much further south. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean, walk us through the numbers. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Ken. Yeah, a lot of uh, activity weather. Um, you know, I've lived on a few continents and I've never seen anything like United States weather patterns. You have, uh, you know, 24-7 television programs that are just weather related. Um, but for the second week in a row, we've got cold air temperatures impacting our markets. Um, uh, you know, we're uh, 40 degrees warmer today here in Boston than it is in Dallas just to put this into context. But even Dallas next week, next Tuesday, it'll be 70 degrees. It'll go from zero to 70 in the space of seven days. So, But there'll be a lot of uh, damage in between, uh, especially to freight networks that are already clogged up. So as a result, uh, last week, um, you know, it really highlights how delicately, delicately balanced freight networks are. It doesn't take much to throw it out of balance. So after the second week of extreme cold dry van load posts surged last week, which is unseasonal, they're up 22% week over week and, and reaching another record level for this time of the year. Capacity did tighten last week, 3% fewer trucks posted for loads. So the load, load to post, load to truck ratio moved up to 5.76. A little bit more pronounced in the refrigerated sector, freezing cold temps drove up demand for reefers. So load posts uh, pushed up about 24% week over week to 12.54. And in the flatbed sector, um, flat uh, volumes also increased by about 7% week over week. So uh, the loader truck ratio moved up about 6% to 56.25. So lots of activity in the spot market last week drove up the equipment uh, types um, uh, at the same time. So in the dry van market condition index, um, our top 10 markets that we take a look at each week represent about a quarter of our volume. Volumes are up about 14% week over week. Uh, in the top 10 markets, capacity tightened, pushed up rates by about five cents a mile. A lot of focus on Chicago this week. I noticed the capacity was particularly tight inbound and outbound to Chicago. Inbound volumes into Chicago and Joliet, they represent about 5% of our weekly volumes. Uh, inbound volumes surged 26% week over week and outbound surged by 32% week over week. So one of the things I noticed was that West Coast volumes are decreasing, so carriers are looking for a lot more revenue to run west. 
So Chicago to Los Angeles, three-day rates are up 23 cents a mile since the end of January. They're averaging close to $2 a mile today. Uh, even loads out of Atlanta to Chicago are up 12 cents a mile over the last two weeks to $1.81. Uh, Short haul loads, Columbus to Chicago, it's only 352 miles. They're up two cents a mile to 258 uh, this week. In the refrigerated sector, uh, load post volumes uh, moved up slightly. Uh, again, Chicago and Joliet were the real focus point this week. Outbound volumes are up 28% week over week in the refrigerated sector. Uh, capacity was tight. Vo uh, rates moved up about 14 cents per mile to $3 a mile average for all outbound loads in Chicago. Uh, in Miami, that was the big story last week in the warmer climate. Uh, volumes were impacted significantly by Valentine's Day roses. Uh, shippers were pretty busy pushing a lot of fresh cut flower loads out around the country. Reefer rates out of Miami uh, pretty much exactly double dry van rates uh, this week, a uh, dollar versus two dollars. Um, so even though load, load post volumes taper off towards the end of the week as the the, shipping, the flower shipping season winds down, capacity was very tight. Uh, rates were up 38 cents a mile last week. Even loads from Miami to Boston were paying 2.63. Uh, Baltimore 2.50 a mile, even as high as $3.41 a mile late last week. In flatbed, um, there's a lot of activity going on uh, around the building industry. It continues to be the star of the economic recovery. We've got low interest rates. It's filling demand for single family housing. Uh, interesting number I saw this week, uh, softwood lumber prices are up 112% year over year and have jumped 10% in the last week. So this, as we as we sort of endure the pandemic, there's a lot of home remodeling and new home building as people sit at home and pour money into uh, their own homes as opposed to traveling and spending money on services. So this is keeping a lot of uh, activity for carriers and brokers in the uh, building sector. Uh, load post volumes in the flatbed market were up 7% last week. Uh, capacity was also tighter in the top 10 markets. Rates moved up by 12 cents a mile. So wrapping up with our year-over-year -year, uh, look at spot rates, uh, as you can see from the chart, we've had a slight upward inflection after falling for most of January and then stabilising at $2.05, uh, excluding fuel. At the start of February, spot rates moved up a few cents last week. They increased by about $0.02 cents a mile to $2.07, uh, still $0.54 cents a mile higher than the same week last year, which is the orange line on the chart. In the refrigerated sector, uh, rates surged last week, uh, not surprisingly because of the cold attempts, they moved up six cents a mile to 2.33. And compared to the orange line on the chart there, they're 51 cents a mile higher than the same week last year. And finally, flatbed rates uh, in slightly higher last week, uh, moving up to $2.21. They've been at this level since the start of October, so not a lot of upward or downward movement here. They've been plateauing around this level. Uh, for that period of time. So that's it for the, the market update this week. If you want to know more about what's happening in freight, go to dat.com forward slash market update and you can download our weekly market update that will be out tomorrow. So that's it, Ken. Um, we'll throw it back to you. All right. Thanks, Dean. So um, Ned is the only one of the three of us that can run the three other models that we typically show, the short term, the blended one and blended two. Um, so with Ned being out, I was actually able to cobble together some charts and graphs. Um, these are different. This um, essentially takes the same look and feel we use for our long-term. So the blue line is actuals. And this is just long haul dry van in this chart that I'm showing now. The gray in the back is the year over year change. So you can see here right before Christmas, we peaked out at about 50% year over year. No fuel, of course. Um, and then we have Raycast, the dotted blue line, um, the high forecast coming out of Raycast, and the low forecast coming out of Raycast. So this is the 35-day Raycast, pretty much exactly as you'd see if you ran a US to US um, in the API. So this is um, uh, exactly what you would see if you ran it for what we call Triptide 7, which is 550 miles or longer. So level setting, what you see here is um, some of the flatness we saw in Q4 of last year, the, the lead up after Christmas into the holiday, and then that collapse we saw to start the year. It seems like rates have just been searching for a direction. Um, mm. The baseline rate cast model seems to be picking up in some of the short term um, inflationary pressures being driven by weather um, and has us cresting a bit uh, through the beginning and the first half of March. Um, me personally, if I were out there in the, in the in the pricing trenches, I might be paying a little bit more attention to the red line here. I don't want to seem overly pessimistic, but um, if this weather situation resolves itself over the next week or so, um, 
I do think there's probably more um, puts than takes, if you will, over the next 35 days. Uh, switching to reefers, this one's a lot more interesting because there's a lot more movement. Uh, we saw more movement in the fourth quarter, culminating to the holiday, uh, more of a collapse. And then um, Raycast, again, these bars look a little wide, but it's just because we zoomed in on the axis to capture historic movement. Really, you're only looking at um, from the, the highest forecast, to the lowest forecast here, about 20 cents, even at uh, period 35. But again, the model, I think, is really just picking up on a, a lack of prevailing, kind of like a lack of trade wind, if you will, to borrow an analogy for what's coming up. Uh, moving to flatbed, um, you can see from the charts Dean showed earlier, not a ton of movement. They've sort of been holding their own. The model is picking up on some inflationary trends just with as things start to fall out a bit in most of the country, theoretically. Um, you'll see building activity pick up, um, stock into shelves at home improvement stores for spring projects, lumber, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it'll be interesting to watch pretty much. I'm more interested in the next 35 days beyond the end of this forecast for flatbed to tell you the truth. Uh, but again, Raycast, the base model is picking up uh, inflationary pressure. The uh, lower of the three forecasts has it holding pretty much constant. And then the higher of the three is really ramping up to um, to uh, at least, I don't know, 10, maybe 12 cents of gain over the next, over the next um, month or so. Mm -hmm. so. That's all we have for the forecasts. If you have any questions, again, about these forecasts or about the long-term forecasts that we're seeing, drop it into the comment or chat below. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean to hit us with the Ask IQ question of the week. Yeah, the, as we started the week, Ken, you and I talked a little bit about 2014 and um, and what the data was telling us about uh, the impact on the freight market. We've had some pretty significant weather events uh, in recent years that have you know, changed the direction of the freight market. So the last big polar vortex we had was in 2014. So the question this week is, uh, it, how different is the polar vortex of 2014 to the polar vortex that we're seeing this week? So, so I can um, maybe kick it off, okay, unless right. you want to, Dean. No, you go. I'm good. Uh, so it made me reminisce a bit. So I started at FedEx uh, the September before the polar vortex of 14. Uh, in a senior pricing role. And um, boy, that was a learning experience. <laughs> Thinking I'm going to have, you know, six months to a year to catch myself after coming from the energy industry, um, kind of leading right into it. I, I could just remember a couple of key differences. Uh, it started earlier, if I remember correctly. I mean, it was, we saw those record lows in early January. And then from, just from memory, I had to go check Wikipedia or something. Um, I remember it stretching a lot further as well. I mean, I can remember it, it, it really stretching into March and April. Right. I saw a lot of friends at the power, in the power industry where we live. And I just remember it just absolutely wreaking havoc across multiple industries. Mm. Um, but as it pertains to freight, the most memorable part was it, it pretty much bucked the entire seasonal trend. Starting mid January, rates began this tremendous run up and then kind of leveling off before it hit spring produce. And it kind of kicked off an entire. 18 month upcycle that didn't end until the industrial recession of 2016. But uh, how do you remember it, Dean? Um, I actually don't remember it from a, a rating perspective. I was uh, deep in uh, commercial truck telematics and, and safety. So in a weird way, I wasn't really focusing on the freight market uh, as it relates to the impact of volumes and, and demand. I do remember that it was the last time that our pond froze when my boys were uh, doing pond hockey skating. Uh, in Boston, that was that was an extremely cold period of time. But the, I talked to some meteorologists here in Boston yesterday, and the big difference this time around is that uh, the 2014 polar vortex was pretty much confined to uh, the sort of the the northern part of the country, extending into New England. So the big difference here is this one is dipping faster the, further south and picking up that colder Gulf air, which is leading to a lot of the icing events that we're seeing all the way from uh, Corpus Christi all the way through here into New England today. And that's um, that's different. Now, I think the, the bigger issue here that we've got to deal with, Ken, is there's a much bigger part of the country that's been impacted by this, parts of the country that don't have snow plows, don't have good salting equipment. Um, so the saving grace has been to a degree that there's not a lot of water, water content in the snow that's uh, accumulating uh, through Texas, so it's it's meaning that it's not icing up as badly, uh, but it's it's 
on the there's another storm coming in tomorrow night that's going to impact the same areas even more so the uh, cold temperatures are going to be here it looks like through sunday based on the forecast and that's going to have i think a much bigger impact on a much bigger percentage of the freight networks and the freight volumes um, when you look at you know anything east of the mississippi is being impacted from it today whether it's tornadoes in the carolinas right through to ice here so uh, I think I think it's a very different event meteorologic, meteorolog uh, from a, you know, a meteorological perspective, but the impact on the freight markets I think is going to be far more profound. Just based on some of the carriers that I'm talking to today, they're still running. Um, you know, truckers can run in pretty much anything other than weather they can't see, which is ice. That's the, that's what will stop you. It's also what will kill you. So a lot of carriers uh, can run in pretty much any snow and wind. Uh, to a point, uh, but it's the ice that really slows everything down. And of course, that'll damage the infrastructure power lines that a lot of manufacturers use to push freight out. So there's a, a flow on effect that affects both the production side and the capacity side. Yeah, I think um, weather serves as like an interesting catalyst in the freight markets. I mean, it, it, weather happens and then it goes away. And I think you can make a case with like a hurricane, there's you know, DAT has studied a lot of the after storm impacts. You know, you have the building materials coming back in, shingles, lumber, and all mm -hmm. that stuff. But generally speaking, it's a pretty acute event. But if you even think about like over the last five to seven years, polar vortex set off that. Um, I don't think of any way to describe it other than like the polar. We, we would just describe it as like the polar vortex driven rally that didn't end until industrial recession, Harvey and Irma and that very active hurricane season in 17 served as like the catalyst leading into ELDs in 17. Um, so we don't dismiss weather. It, it's something almost impossible to forecast long-term um, in our models, but it's why we sort of keep a long-term short-term eye on the markets and compare those two. Um, going you forward know, i mean if you think about we've already got a situation where capacity is very tight especially for a lot of large truckload carriers so even before this storm it it uh, didn't take much to throw the networks out of balance so I, I was looking at some websites today some ltl carriers where they've got most of their terminals shut down today and have and they shut them down yesterday and probably will have them closed through tomorrow um, you've got truck stops without power so uh you know when trucks can't fuel up they sit um, you know, they're idling, freight's delayed. So I think this will, there'll be a compounding effect that we'll start to see later this week into next week. And given that we already had a tight capacity situation and rates moved up this week uh, before these storms hit, you could almost uh, expect that we'll start to see more upward pressure on spot rates into next week as as we start to work our way out of this particular, um, these two storm, that, this double punch that we're, we're getting this week. Yeah, I mean, again, I... I personally don't want to shovel my driveway. So I, I hope that this goes away um, as quickly as humanly possible. But um, again, it's something, I, you know, your interests are very different as well. I mean, if I was an asset-based trucking company, I'm thinking, as you mentioned, about the literal nuts and bolts of trucking. Like, how am I going to mm -hmm. plow my yard? How am I going to you know, make sure that my drivers are safe and I'm maintaining service? I, well, you've, you've already sent me a bunch of service bulletins from asset-based carriers. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm in a smaller fleet or even an owner operator, I'm thinking about where am I going to park? Where am I going to grab a hot shower? Um, a lot of these truck stops are, are closed. You, you send over those bulletins as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it, the best advice I give to shippers all the time is that think of like, think like a carrier for a minute. So, you know, if I'm a shipper, I'm very interested in what's happening in my carrier base. Um, and understanding that they may be going through some challenges might level set your expectations about what to, mm -hmm. uh, around service and, um, I wouldn't run it by this by the skin of your teeth, so to speak, from an inventory perspective right now. Yeah, you've got you've got a lot of um, you know from on the carrier side, there's a lot of uh, difference in how drivers approach this. Uh, you know, some new hires that I talk to are, are literally scared to run in bad weather like this, so they'll they'll tend to be uh, more cautious and pull over and um, you know go out of service until they can get back on the road. More experienced guys can keep running; uh, they'll keep running far longer. Uh, in bad storms. Even some of the larger fleets have automated systems where they'll take weather uh, and then pair in the telematics devices of the trucks. They'll look at driver tenure and they'll make some sort of arbitrary decision around whether the truck should shut down or run. Uh, but with weather forecasting at such a, 
uh, low level of granularity, they can actually determine when to shut their capacity down and when to keep it running. So most carriers are pretty good at this. Um, a lot of drivers are sort of given a fair bit of leeway to run in inclement weather. Uh, what compounds it, though, is a lot of these fleets don't have CB radios in their trucks. So that's why you see a lot of them ploughing into the back of each other, uh, because no one's warning um, each other and the and the vehicle to vehicle telematics devices aren't talking to each other. So they're warning them about hard braking events up ahead. So we're still seeing these massive pileups on interstates. Um, there's a lot more we could do to, to make this safer, but there's a there's a really big ripple effect that go, that'll go on for about a week until I think freight networks get back into balance. Probably more so on the LTL side. Uh, where they need a lot of hub and spoke terminals to keep operating. It's a little bit different in the truckload sector, but and maybe that's something where we'll see the impact then because of all the uh, the increase in e-commerce, final mile freight, and the impact. Um, you know, some of the earnings calls this week from the large LTL carriers are, are reporting pretty high year over year volumes uh, due to the pandemic and the switch there. So maybe it'll be the LTL markets that are impacted the most. Yeah, a lot of mode shifting happening. Um, you want to hit us with some questions? I see a bunch of them stacked up here. Uh, where whereabouts? I can't see them here, Ken. All right, I can see them. So David asks, with lots of freight off of Los Angeles, um, I'm assuming that's Los Angeles and not Louisiana, do you expect rates to go back up? Um, I actually, while we were chatting, I pulled it, David. Um, I just pulled uh, LA to Dallas. I'm not sure I can screen share here, but um, we can maybe make this available as an image later. Um, over the last week, we have seen a little bit of an increase, maybe eight, nine cents up. Um, but again, that's following a effectively like a 75, 80 cent drop since the start of the new calendar year. So um, a little bit of relief. Um, let me pull Chicago real quick, LA to Chicago. It's um, 218 I've got here. That's that's Ontario. Sorry. Yeah, it's up a little bit more, I would say. Mm. Um, maybe up 20 cents, but it didn't fall as much. That's a little bit more of a right. uh, more balanced lane, I would say. Yep. The important point here, Ken, is that I looked at the import volumes for the end of January. They're down 1% uh, year over year. So they're up 22% in December. The import volumes have fallen right away on the West Coast, Um a lot of ships are moving to other ports. So I think the volumes have dropped right away on the West Coast. It was the first time that um, in weeks that Ontario and Los Angeles dropped out of our top 10 outbound markets. So that'll be, that's part of the reason that volume is, uh, the rates have dropped right away there. And they're expecting that those volumes, even though they've got congestion, those volumes not to, um, you know, materially increase over time. They should just stay where they are. It's like a funnel, right? I mean, the practical example is I could put a cup of water in a funnel and I could put a five gallon bucket of water in a funnel. We could in frame here. Mm -hmm. You're only going to get so much water out of the funnel at a time, right? So that's kind of, we have a lot of these conversations over the past couple of weeks about congestion and what that means. And um, there's a lot of intricacies happening at the port as it pertains to um, truckload uh, demand. You know, even you can go get your binoculars and see all these vessels docked off the coast. But um, if there's not enough draymen and uh, dock space and all of the necessary infrastructure to get the boats unloaded, it's not, I mean, it's still going to make its way into the back of a truck at the same relative pace. Right. So um, be interesting to see what happens when California returns to a little bit more normal from a coronavirus perspective. Because I know that there's still a lot of issues surrounding that in terms of um, distance at work and things like that for the dock workers. I noticed, um, I'm just pulling up the data here from the peers database of the uh, West Coast volume. So uh, year over year changes, if I could just quickly look at West Coast volume. So Los Angeles volumes uh, for January, uh, so Long Beach, the I think it's the larger of the two ports. So they, it's a rough share, but they were down three percent year over year uh, on at that particular port at the end of January. Whereas on the big coasts, on the big ports on the east coast uh, here in New York, for, for example, volumes were up seventeen percent. Savannah up twenty four percent. Norfolk up the same. Charleston. So most of the east coast ports had a, a, a substantial increase in import volumes at the end of January, whereas the west coast volumes were declining uh, rapidly. Cool. And that's the JOC Pierce data set. Shout out 
awesome right. data set if anyone's interested in tracking port volumes. Yep. Or is it IHS market? Either way. Same. IHS market, yep. Yeah, same deal. Um, so David also asked, and Dean, this one's going to be all you because I'm quite frankly not even sure what what this acronym or abbreviation is. How do you expect the Gulf to see... Oh, he's saying Chicago to expect rates at all. Is that what he's saying? How do you see HGO? Well, good question. David, if you don't mind dropping a clarification, uh, maybe we're just missing. It's like whooshing over our heads here. If you can C give us a little bit of it. Yeah. Um, VS Carriers asks, what do you expect on flatbed rates through the summer? Dean mentioned machinery imports are going down. How will it be affecting to a market? Being I think... Yeah, I think we'll see more of the same. I think the building industry is going to continue to be really robust, um, and that's going to drive a lot of uh, demand for building materials and lumber in particular. So I expect I expect it to continue on just the exact same way it has done, um, because there's a lot of demand for new homes, uh, home remodeling that we touched on earlier in this period of low interest rates. So I'm expecting demand for flatbeds to continue um, well into the summer. I'm going to have like a get off my lawn slash out over my skis moment. Um, I mean, I think a lot of the, everything that we're saying is, as it pertains to that is, is true, right? But we're playing a pretty dangerous game of chicken with inflation here. I mean, mm -hmm. the money printer can only print money for so long until there are pretty heavy ramifications. I mean, right, right. you know, money is still free to borrow or it's, it's seemingly printing it at a, with zero repercussions, but just kind of my prevailing thought is that it's only fine until it's not. I don't think that's a linear slope. I think if you, you know, it could, you reach a tipping point of printing, 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 and then um, all of a sudden you look around and you're in pretty deep, deep trouble. So, I mean, to the extent that interest rates stay low and you can go buy a you know, double the price of house you were expecting and keep your payment the same. Hmm. Um, yep. I mean, it's just, it's just wild, right? 15 year mortgage rates are like, bumping up against 2%. Yep. Um, yep. And, uh, you know, new home inventory levels are, are still really low. There's still demand. Um, people are still looking to move out of cities. Now they know they can work from home and sustain that lifestyle. So there's a, there's a real shift. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be very interesting. Like I said, the flatbed sector is the most tied to capital investment, in my opinion, um, at least the way we think about things. I mean, we can make some, I think once you start looping in private and dedicated, maybe that, maybe that shifts a bit, but um, through the context of how we're looking at things for this show, I think flatbed's the most direct tie to capital, larger capital investment. And that's most tied to general economic conditions, um, interest rates and general kind of forward looking sentiment on the economy. Hmm. Um, Matthew Fink, great article regarding winter storm Stella, which was 2014. I didn't even know they were naming winter storms back then. Um, so I learned something today that effectively knocked out 23% of chocolate capacity. Hmm. Um, it's interesting. I don't know what that means. Knocked out 23% of chocolate capacity. I mean, it wasn't permanently knocked out, right? I mean, the trucks didn't get buried under snow and then disappear. Um, so, I mean, all these things right become temporary. Hmm. Um, I'm sure, I mean, again, a lot, I think sometimes we have this, um, illusion that small fleets have a team of accountants managing their money you know, being out for a week or two could mortally wound the finances for a small carrier. So that could be true that some of that capacity never came back, right? Possible, yep. I'll have to read that article. All right, Zach Pearson asks, question out of left field, in your opinion, would it benefit independent drivers as well as companies if there were an independent freight transportation system that is separate from consumer travel? Hmm. I'll try to understand Let's that see. question. Yeah, I'm not sure I follow. Maybe something like an airline, but for freight, I'm not sure. Um, a lot of good questions. I mean, they're stumping us. Maybe it's um, I'm not getting my studio energy today. The basement doesn't have quite the mental percolation powers. So sorry, Zach. I, I'm not sure I'm following. If you want to um, maybe shoot us a note to askIQ at dat.com, we can dig into that one. But um, hmm. I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that one's a, that's, I'm stumped on that. I've been looking at that for about a minute and I can't figure out what that means. To take that one on notice and get back to Zach. Uh, Victor asks, in terms of inflation, what's one thing, one thing that is keeping it away is the velocity of money. How many times money supply changed hands looking like a tight 21? I mean, 
not to get too much in the weeds here, but um, at least for me personally, anecdotally, the stimulus is working, right? I mean, they send me money and I go spend it. Um, but I mean, I mean, look, I, I think one thing is certain. You could take every single finance and economics tech, textbook printed before 2020 and throw it into a giant pile and burn it to keep warm during this winter polar vortex because none of it makes any sense. You have Reddit driving the stock market into a frenzy, causing hedge funds to short and have to dump positions in good stocks, which is, I mean, none of it makes any sense. Um, so, I mean, I think we can try our best to, you know, explain it, but I'm not sure that there's any sort of um, hard and fast rule to explain what's going on. I just know that at the, at, at the most basic level, going back to when, um, you know, cavemen were exchanging beads, creating more beads, devalues the cost, you know, the, the value of the beads in circulation. So um, it will catch up, I would have to imagine, but maybe it won't. I don't know. Maybe we can print money indefinitely and nothing will, uh, um, nothing will come of it. So Zach did clarify something along the lines of a separate highway system for freight. This is just me speaking. Um, I think that's almost going to be a necessity when it comes to driverless trucks. I think it's almost a necessary requirement to have a separate lane or some sort of way for those driverless presumably electric trucks to be separate from, you know, someone driving a Prius or a Tesla um, down the road. So I think that's something that I know that a lot of folks are in talks about. Um, I think truthfully, that could be one of the first big steps over the next 10 years to like a, a long haul. One of the first long haul driverless routes would be some sort of dedicated lane or dedicated road cross country, somewhere like an I-80 or an I-90 um, that connects East and West for driverless. They've got them on uh, the I five out of uh, on the west coast already, but that's mainly because of hills, right? Um, is the spot rate uptick solely related to weather? Um, I wouldn't say solely. I mean, I would say the majority of it we're seeing in the extreme short term is weather related, especially in reefer. Wouldn't you say, Dean? Yeah, absolutely. Weather related um, this week. Yeah, we saw some of the steam coming out of that decline though before the extreme weather hit. So I think they were reaching a support level in dry van on that long haul rate of about two, two Oh five a mile. And they've just been sort of hovering there. Um, so I, I, again, I think the, the, the short term bump off that floor is weather related reaching that floor. I'm not so sure was weather related. Hmm. Um, so Robert, I'm sorry, previous to last week's spot rates were falling downwards and it seemed like capacity was softening. I mean, no, I mean that, Robert, that, that's all true. I mean, we saw leading into the year um, capacity coming into the market. More importantly, we saw demand for freight shifting over to the contract side. It just seems like the combination of weather, a little bit of uptick in West Coast volume um, have all sort of come together to, to put a little bit of a stop to how far rates have come down. Uh, that's not to say that once we get past this weather, we can't, we might not see another dip before we get into produce season. Mm. Um, that's sort of the reason why Greatcast is sort of punting a bit, right? It's just sort of saying things are going to be flat because it, there's no strong evidence in either direction to drive rates up or down. Um, last one from VS Carriers. If you would have an option to invest money in a trucking business, would you choose drive in, reefer, or flatbed step deck? Hmm. You want to take a first uh, yeah. crack at that? Um in the, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, my my preference would be refrigerated, always refrigerated. Uh, I think we had this question last week. I'd always take the weight penalty and the extra costs because a refrigerated trailer is going to give you far more options for a greater span of the year. Um, that said, uh, highly specialised drop decks, step decks, ramps, uh, outriggers, extendable, you know, flatbed type trailers, there's a lot of uh, good margin to be made in those those sectors. They're highly specialised. You don't do a lot of miles, but the miles are very profitable. So I've always uh, been an advocate for find a market that's underserviced and specialise in it and build your equipment around that as opposed to getting the equipment and then trying to shoehorn freight into it. It's a different way to look at demand, but that's, I always look at underserviced sectors and then build capacity around that. I think the flat thing is like, do you want to be doing that work? Especially if you're going to be the one in the truck, you want to have to go either do it yourself or recruit drivers to tarp yeah. and stop right. every what couple hundred miles at a minimum 
to uh, yep. check to make sure everything's secured. Yep. On a day like today, you're going to be out in this weather, making sure your load might be tarped if it needs to be tarped or definitely yep. secured. And yeah, um, it's given the choice between reefer and flatbed. Yeah, and dry van. I think. Yeah. Do you want volume or do you want to make a little more money for a little more work? I think becomes the question yeah. between reefer and dry van. Personally, there's, there's but, different pressures too on on each of them, so it's you've got to be cut out for it physically, mentally. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to wrap up. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone. This has been awesome. Uh, we're getting more and more questions every week. It's honestly the best part of the show. Um, this when we get to interact with you guys and answer your questions. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for tuning in on a, on a snowy day in February here. Um, if you, uh, if you're also interested in checking out other content, like I mentioned earlier in the show, the 2021 freight focus is a, it's a quick read, but it's, it's pretty short and sweet with some really interesting things to, to think about for 21. Also check out Chris Kaplis's freight find podcast. It's either just been released or due to be released with, um, CEO, president CEO of Boyle transportation, who's handling vaccine distribution. Um, so that one's really cool. Um, I would recommend checking that out. And we just filmed a really, really great interview with David Spencer to Rive Logistics. That should air first week of March-ish. But if, you ha if you're if you at a broker and you have any interest in pricing and business in intelligence um, as you grow, uh, that's going to be an awesome conversation. We covered a lot of ground specific to that. And I I'd highly recommend checking that out when it releases. And we'll have more information for that in the next couple of weeks when it's going to specifically be out. But with that, we're going to sign off. I'm going to go suit up, grab my snow shovel, and uh, if you don't hear from me, maybe let the authorities know. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Have a great week. Bye.